<laughs> Welcome to Video Church. For those who don't know what Video Church is, is that we often use the byline, meaning the subtopic or the expression underneath the words Video Church, as Utah's only all outdoor church. And what we mean by that is that everything we do technically is outdoors. Oh sure, there may be a little bit of video editing that goes on indoors, but recording, discussing, relating, involving people, ministry, those things that are commonly associated as being indoors, we choose to do outdoors. Likewise, why we say Utah is because we're in Utah. <laughs> I imagine that if I move, I would probably have to change the name, but wherever I go and God inspires me to record, we use that in Vidivo ministry as part of Vidivo church because I'm quote unquote ordained no, I've been called, you know, and I've been ordained, and I've been a minister for a while now. And, you know, I've been a born-again Christian since the early days of the Jesus movement, or maybe the latter days. Who knows? One of the days. But as much as I've been involved in other people's ministries, I wasn't involved in Vidivo ministry until one day God called me into doing what I'm doing now. Now, he called me into the ministry the day I got saved. I mean, that was just kind of like obvious by the gifts of the Spirit I was given, the things that were happening, all that was occurring. I don't know about anyone else, but I know for me, God called me into ministry that moment. He called me again later. He called me again later. And many times I kind of resisted the idea of being, quote unquote, in the ministry. But as I began to learn about what God meant by ministry, I realized that everyone from the moment God calls them and begs them or pleads with them or influences them to come unto him from that moment on they technically really are in the ministry it becomes a testimony and I can dare say that if you understood this through Christian philosophy and there is such a thing as Christian philosophy it's used a lot nowadays to claim to be the truth but in Christian philosophy, the idea of even using non-Christians would be in the ministry. So when people try to define ministry and those things that are involved in ministry, you got to take it with a grain of salt, which is why we started this, quote, new series to put you in remembrance of those things that you should know. Maybe you do know. Maybe you've heard it in the past. But the things which we have heard, the things which we have seen, the things which we have handled with our own hands is what we talk about in relationship to Vidivo Church and Vidivo Ministry. Because here in this ministry, we are about the Word of God, obviously, which you might call the Bible, but Mine is not exactly the Bible because I have lots of Bibles. What makes them the Word of God is our expression of definition of our statement of faith. Our statement of faith is pretty simple. It's basically one line. I used to try to write a whole bunch of them and come up with all these, you know, esoteric, theologically correct, you know, didactic statements that came off as being, you know, hermeneutically and homiletically correct, you know, and for theology, even that was questionable once I looked at them, and even as I examine other people's statements of faith, I have to go, nah, I don't think so. They look good, they sound good, but do they live good? No, they don't. They, they, they don't breathe, they don't have life, they're not human. They're idealism that's personified in expressionism that is the outward manifestation of what we want to be not what we are today. And so I had to redefine a lot of things in my mind as well as in my heart so that it would influence my soul so that my spirit would become one with my 
body, soul, and spirit in agreement with what God was doing in my life. And what that means in the long and the short is that we define the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God of the Son of God, Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean we don't go to the non-Christian or the people that are not of God, but rather we define the Word of God as being that with which the Spirit of God causes the scriptures, the words themselves, to become alive and to become living and breathing and even visible, so to speak, as Jewish legends. Jewish mysticism likes to say, oh, we saw the Torah flying in the sky and it gave us these words that came out as written in gold to become the... and then they get into something weird, usually, which would be like the... well, not Talmud, but the... Um, now I'm blank and drawing a blank, you know. Such a deal, Jew without a word, you know. Oh, well, well, God. But no, the uh, Kabbalah from the Kabbalistic thought, from the writings of the Kabbalah. I can't think of the name of the book itself, but one man's idea. And that's where we get into issues when we get to one man doing something. Jewish logic often is defined by following one man, one rabbi, one rabbi's teaching. You'll hear the school of Hillel, the school of Gamaliel, the um, Maimonides or Nachmanides, or you might say Muhammad, who compiled, you know, the stories of the, of the Islamic faith, or Confucius, one man. You see, there's a definition here that's problematic when it comes to religion, because it often is birthed in and following one man. Now, the Word of God has come through many men, but it's also come from the Son of God when men no longer believe what God has said to you. That even Jesus himself told the parable of what and why he had come. He sent them prophets, he sent them teachers, he sent them kings, he sent them all kinds of people that God gave messages to, to tell his people what to do, and they refused them. So then he decided to send his son, and they killed him instead, which, unfortunately for most Jewish people, that uh, he rose from the dead. Oops, made a mistake, got the wrong one. So, frankly, when we talk about religious expressions or religious ideas, no matter who you are, what kind of Christian, what type of Christian, what religious doctrine you follow, what Christianity expression you say you're a part of, you're probably following the tenements or the ideology of a man. So we want to change that, not because we're the only ones that have ever done that, there are lots of people through the years who have used this medium to express the reality of our personal relationships that we each and every one of us must have in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that is the fact that if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have Jesus, you're not going there. You're going to hell. And Tozer, Spurgeon, any number of men of God that you might have heard their names of that are popular today um, have all stated that at some point in time, but they hear it, but become dull of hearing, and so they have to be put into remembrance, as Paul said. And I think that's what's happened in fundamental Christianity today. Not fundamentalism, not evangelicalism, but I mean just the basics of anyone looking at and trying to understand what the Christian faith is that follows Jesus. Now, there's a Christian faith that doesn't follow Jesus. And there's a Christian faith that claims it's Christian that doesn't follow God. There's all kinds of things like that. Even in Jewish culture, which is supposed to be the people of God, is very much anti-God. Very humanistic, very psychologically oriented, but not godly. And that's why the two prophets will come to Israel and will be speaking to the children of Israel. I mean, the world will be listening, but they're condemning because they represent the law and the prophets, what the children of Israel have done by following the Antichrist, 
and the false prophet and how they are living their lives because it's false. Much like I hate to say it, this series is going to address maybe two, maybe two like two, in dealing with what is false and what is true. And I'm not going to call you a true Christian because that's false. Anytime you say something's true, you're more likely setting yourself up for false. Because the reality isn't about true or false, but the consciousness and the awareness of being in relationship and interlocution, or I like to say intercourse with God. God, by way of His Spirit, interposing Himself in your life in a dynamic way that is possible Because God talks to you and you talk to God. Jesus had that reputation. Every night he prayed. He was alone with his father. He spent that time making sure he knew what he was doing the next day. Because after three and a half years, the disciples could say, these are the things we saw him do. These are the things that we heard him say. These are the things that we know were of Jesus. And so they compiled those and we become aware of them through the written word of God that is technically the Bible. But still doesn't apply to us unless you have the Spirit of God within you. Meaning that you have the same ability that the disciples were given in the book of Acts. That God suddenly explodes his awareness upon you by coming inside of you, by giving you a new birth, a born-again experience, a born of the Spirit, and then filling you by way of the Spirit of God choosing to take over your life causing you to have a dynamic interpersonal relationship that is with God and not with only your own intellect or your mental assertions. In some ways, psychologists are correct when they say that religion is the opiate of the masses, or they'll say, I mean, that was a different famous quote, but they'll say that, you know, religion is created to fill the void or the gap of man and his emotions. And it's true, that is, but not a relationship with God. A relationship with God is different. A relationship with God means you will use religion to enhance your relationship with God. It's the right hand and the left hand of faith. The reality being that you cannot have one without the other. You can't have faith without religion and religion without faith. It just doesn't work that way. You will have as an outward demonstration of your lifestyle religion. Every man has religion, we're told, in the Word of God. So. What we're doing is we're trying to get back to, not the basics, back to, not the Bible, back to, not the Word of God, but back to some things that you should know that you might already have heard, but maybe you're not living it like you know you should do. And that is why we call this, I still want to say living in eternity, but I've already used that moniker for some other series, and then I want to say Principles of Life, but the reality is that I've already have a series going called Principles of Life that deals with interpersonal um, conflicts that people go through and how to resolve them and how to deal with them. But I think we're calling this series, hmm, what do you think of? <laughs> life Lessons. And then we'll, you know, add whatever section that it might be about. And in relationship to how people tend to, well, what's your context? Well, trust. You know, who do you trust in? What do you trust in? How do you trust? You know, where are you coming from? Where are you going? How are you getting there? And that's what trust is all about. You think, by way of assumption, sometimes, based upon religion, that if you go to church, you're going to get to heaven. Or... If you go to church, you're going to be a good person. Or if you go to church, you're going to get a message that's going to save you. And that may have been true at one time. Maybe there was a time and a place where going to church meant something different than what it means today. Today, going to church is like going to the mall. While there's the mall, which you know obviously is a big building, there's a lot of stores inside the mall. And inside the mall, I like to go shopping. Now, there's food stores inside the mall, you know, the food court, and that's kind of my first place to stop because I get hungry and I get thirsty. So 
I eat what I want, you know, if I have an appetite, I choose either some taco food or I'll choose some hamburgers or maybe some pizza or some Chinese food, or maybe I'll try something different, you know, because after all, I'm in the mall. I can walk through the mall, I can look at things, I can window shop, I can view, I can talk to people, you know, I mean, I, I kind of like malls. It gives me a variety of experiences that are often equatable to life. And so, in religion and in church, you see a lot of the same things. Going to church, to me, is kind of like going to the mall. I see mega churches that have mega opportunities. You know, I mean, well, that's nice. But really, they're kind of like about as personal as a mall can be. The mall, you can hook up with your buddies and friends and all go to the mall and a lot of times my sister does that you know she uh, God bless her she after 20 years you know told me I was right about something I mean it took her 20 years of saying no you know to finally say you right and I'm like okay <laughs> I don't mind you know I mean I've been told I'm wrong for lots of things you know and I just wait and long enough and sure enough people change their minds I don't, because I get it from God. If I get something from God, I don't change my mind. I just keep saying it over and over again. I don't change it or rearrange it or make it into something new. I just keep saying the same thing. So, what you're about to hear isn't anything new or different. And taking a bunch of friends to the mall, you've already been to a mall before. You've probably been to a strip mall or you've been to a grocery store that has multiple departments inside, which is kind of like a mini mall. I mean, you know, it's kind of like its own version of one. But a mall, you can buy clothes, or you can buy camping gear, or you can buy, you know, competing clothes, you know, expensive ones, cheap ones, you know, um, fashion ones, men's, women's, in-betweens. <laughs> I mean, you know, the mall has everything, whatever that can sell, which is a key issue. You see, the mall wants to sell you something. They want you to spend your time there. You know, grocery stores have begun to develop this mall mentality where they put in a coffee shop so you can sit down and have coffee while you're shopping, you know, and checking out the groceries. And a lot of times churches are doing that. You know, they put in a coffee shop and they put in a restaurant and they put in this, that and the other thing so that you can get comfortable, you know, to sit down and maybe talk about God. Now, I don't know if you've ever sat inside some of the churches, coffee shops. I have. I've actually spent a lot of time kind of observing things from the perspective of an outsider looking inside. But then again, sometimes I feel like an outsider looking inside, even though it's a church. But I've been to a lot of churches. And it is interesting, the conversations that go on. You see, when you were living with Jesus, if you were a disciple, it was pretty obvious what he was doing. I mean, I imagine even going to the bathroom was a religious experience. Okay, maybe not, but for some people, today it is. But, you know, I look at, frankly, if they lived with him, if they camped with him, they had to have known that he went, you know, like, excuse me, I'll be right back. You know, went out in the wilderness and dug a little ditch, you know, and did his duty. Or did you never think that Jesus actually had a bowel movement? or dare I say, urinated. <laughs> Excuse me, that's ungodly. No, it's not. You see, there's a certain amount of life lessons that we need to experience and put into the reality of the context of Jesus teaching us, Jesus leading us, we following him. And I know someone's gonna say, well, what kind of bowel movement did he have? <laughs> Holy. <laughs> No, but you know, I mean, holy, you know, like that one expression was from way back when, holy cow manure. You get it. So the point being is that that's not what we're talking about, but that's what some people would talk about and some people would, you know, get involved in. But when it comes to this series of videos, when it comes to life lessons, we want to examine all that God wants for us. Because if you're living your life ignoring God, you know, parts of your day, or 
most of your week or most of your year, you're going to hell. I'm straight up with you. You're going to hell. I don't care what kind of grace you got. I don't care the parable of the you know, prodigal son. Frankly, you're going to hell. I mean, because you're not going to have enough guts, enough honesty, or enough truth to say to yourself, hey, I'm in trouble. I need help. No, you're going to compromise because God even said he would send delusion upon the whole world. I mean, if we look at Christianity today, they're voting for Trump. Now, I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know when or where they get this idea, but that's what they're doing. So, okay, you know, they're easily persuaded as a crowd of Jews were to choose Barabbas over Jesus. They were persuaded. There were instigators in the crowd, but still, the point being is that who or what are you trusting in? Now, for me, our vision, as some people like to call it, I don't call it a vision. I just say, hey, this is what I do. I do what I do, and I do what I do. And what I did was what I do. You know, and I still do it today. So I'm still doing what I did back then and now. Jesus. It was in the beginning, Jesus. In the middle, it was Jesus. And in the end, it'll be Jesus. And whether I'm in sin, there's Jesus. Whether I'm in righteousness, there's Jesus. And whether I'm backslidden, there's Jesus. Or whether I'm in, you know, flying through the air in the rapture, there's Jesus. Jesus is everywhere. And there isn't anywhere that he isn't. If you would just realize that, it will change your life. So when you're in despair or despondency, or you're about to shoot yourself, or you're shooting up drugs, or you're getting drunk, you know, um, in a bar, Jesus is there. Yeah. It's obvious. It's like you're on a stage and behind the scenes or in the audience are the angels and they're sitting there watching you. What? No, don't tell me. Please. He's not going to do that. Is he going to do that? You, do you think they, they, you know, is it in the script? I don't see it in the script, but God, is it in the script? And the angels are watching, wondering, waiting, looking and going, you're kidding me. He did do it. You're a movie to an angel. Yeah. Your life. All your life. And that's what the point is of this introduction, so to speak, to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We're not just going to talk about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We're going to take, and I want to make this clear, this is an in-depth Bible study. This isn't just some casual introduction to, you know, ah, I got a personal opinion, I'm going to, you know, shoot off my mouth, you know, and pretend that somebody's going to listen. No. This is an in-depth living experience of life that is giving you lessons to apply directly to today, right now, where you're at, no matter who you are. These will fit whether you're Donald Trump or whether you're, you know, uh, President Obama, Hillary Clinton, you know, or just, you know, some backslidden, born-again Christian evangelical who's misled and misinterpreting the Bible. And a lot of people are. You know, they think America is, you know, like the chosen people or the chosen ones. I still don't get the idea. I mean, there's even a Jewish rabbi running around trying to tell everyone that, oh, you guys are, you know, like God's work is special with you. Uh -huh. Buy my book and you'll see how. Right. Sure. <laughs> okay. There were lots of Jews at the time of Jesus doing the same thing until they met Jesus. Somehow. If you haven't understood this yet, when you actually come into contact with Jesus, when you start dealing with the reality of real life, it's not Mr. Nice Guy, but it's not, you know, Mean Gene, you know, or Mean Joe Green, you know, on his, you know, dumping machine. No, it's not. It's not wonderful it's not terrible it's holy meaning complete it's a all enveloping experience if you're so broken that you know any amount of love would be enough to feel it that you could just explode from it then yeah jesus will give you the most incredible experiences of life that you've ever encountered before but if you're already pretty kind of like that hardcore, and he's going to break you. I mean, really, he's going to hit you right between the eyes where it hurts. 
And that can be in spiritual pride, too. I know Jimmy Swigert was brought down to humility. I know Jim Baker was brought down from ministry. I know many people today are failing the tests of President Obama's presidency by being bitter and hateful and spiteful because President Obama went to church for quite a few years, like maybe 30 or 20. And all that time, he knew what Jesus said. Yeah. So I don't know about what your experience in church is, but if you're going to stack up your religious life against the president's, Jesus is the one who's going to examine it, not you, not me. You see, we're going to take everything that Jesus said and take a look at it. I mean, one at a time. We're not going to say, oh, well, he didn't mean that, and then jump to some other, well, what's it say in you know, Deuteronomy 15.3, and eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Because here's the problem we have with the reality of what people are trying to do when they argue about what Jesus said. They'll take what Jesus said and then immediately go away from what he said to what they mean. Today, there's no excuse anymore. You can't use a computer without knowing there's a Google on it. I mean, any browser will come up with Chrome sooner or later, and Chrome will lead you to Google, and if you Google anything, you'll learn about you know, a lot of things you didn't know before. So there's no excuse about not knowing what Jesus said. But there is an excuse for being misled about what Jesus said. And that's why we did a Bible study a while back, you know, uh, a few years ago, and recorded them called Jesus Said. And they were powerful, and people argued everything except what Jesus said. You see, they can quote their personal interpretation of something else. They can cry out about true this or false that, but they can't deal with what does this say to me right now. And I don't mean what would Jesus do, because Jesus isn't dead. I mean, if he is for you, then you've got a problem. You need to pursue your religious experience until you know Jesus is alive and speaking. If you don't know that he's speaking, then you haven't read the Bible. I mean, put it bluntly, what are you doing? Stop studying Old Testament law, or how I'm going to witness to somebody, or how I'm going to apologize for God, you know, by arguing someone into the kingdom of heaven, that doesn't work. Rather, find out what Jesus said, and then deal with it. I mean, that's the reality of all that the disciples did. They weren't debating about, well, did Jesus talk from the school of Hillel, or did he talk from the school of Gamaliel? Well, no, he talked about hell. <laughs> no offense, but El was not it. And that's what God is, El in Hebrew. But really, what Jesus was about was his father. Jesus talked about his father. He said, look, this is what you do. I want to tell you what to do. And so he did. He started off with the Sermon on the Mount, and then at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, this is what happens if you do these things. If you don't do these things, you go to hell. So... I don't know that you don't know that, but I do know that you don't do that. Because if you can even begin to think that, you know, your political solution, your militaristic solution, your guns, your violence, your hate, your television, your internet, your Facebook, your Twitter, your phone, all these things you think that our solutions or tools are going to help you, what are you going to do in a spiritual warfare or a spiritual battle when you have nothing but your mouth and your spirit? I mean, you can be like those Pentecostals who are dead wrong by saying, I declare that I say that this is going to happen. Well, you can declare all you want to, but I, I got news for you. Your declarations are going to be held against you because <laughs> they didn't happen. Just saying, Jesus already covered it. So, when we do this study, as we continue forward in it, it will always be about taking whatever you see in the title and talking about it, meaning to the nth degree, which boils down to trust. Because everything 
that Jesus said is recorded well. Everything that we have of what Jesus said is recorded for us in the Bible. You don't have to go from one Bible to another. They're all the same in regards to that. There's no differences. You can play nuances, but there's no difference. The Holy Spirit of God will cause you to know that Jesus said it. No doubt about it. All you got to do is say, God, is this true? And God says, yeah, it's true. And you go, okay. Because there's a couple of principles we're going to lay down in this introduction so you know. The first one is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Take it apart, eat it, beat it, tear it into it, get into it, whatever you want to do. Trust, you know, do word studies. Trust, and then trust what? Trust in, and then what do you trust in? Trust in the, the what? Not uh, but the, and why is it the, not uh, and why is it of, and or the, not of, and why is it the, not, you know, some other uh, present tense participle preposition, you know? So do all that if you want to. Trust in, trust, use that, hold back to, and of, or the Lord, you know, trust in the Lord. Lord, trust in the Lord, in trust, you know, and all that, and just reword it if you want to. If there ever was a scripture that you can't screw up, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is it. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. With what? In, of, all, by, which, where, for, and because of. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Not some part in, for, and of, solution to, and concerning of, there, whereby. Meaning not into thine own understanding. And I love not being thrown there instead of lean forward, lean back, lean with, lean because, lean mean, or lean towards, or thoughtful, or any other word, but meaning not, meaning no, because not makes sense for anyone that's listening to leaning and saying not, into what? Thy, yours, hmm, ours, yes, and all of them, uh-huh, because it's thy own, meaning without that with which God is saying, understanding, and I was like, man, okay. And then we have, as a second principle, besides Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which is, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. <laughs> as my wife likes to say, it's got an S on it. Okay. And um, I always give her that credit. She cut me over. But um, with that... Then, if you're not leaning your understanding, what do you understand? Well, if any man like wisdom, let him ask of God, who prayed it down, but gives all minority. Go to James 1 5. James was the brother of Jesus, screwed up, didn't know, couldn't understand, was anti Jesus, and became pro Jesus. Yeah, imagine that. Brother of Jesus. So, really, Proverbs 3 5 and 6, James 1 5, sets us up for this study. You can tear all those apart and find out all that you're going to need as far as tools are concerned, which is nothing as far as, you know, knowing the Greek, knowing the Hebrew, using the present tense of the Greek, you know, using the koine or the, any of the others. You don't need to. You're not stupid. I mean, come on. We're going to use blood English or blood people that want to be blunt about it because guess what? God's not going to come up to you and say, well, I understand you didn't understand because you didn't understand that you should have understood what you didn't understand. But because you don't understand, you can't be held accountable for what you didn't understand. Want to bet? <laughs> uh, ignorance is not an excuse. And according to Romans, no man has ignorance of the Bible or of God. At some point in time, he's revealed himself to everyone. Everyone. Everyone means everyone, and it doesn't mean anyone without having had some kind of encounter with God. So everyone is everyone. And since God is the judge of what he means, I think God can interpret what he means by what he means. Because he already said that he would. Because we're given the Holy Spirit of God to know what he means. So, you don't get an excuse. So really, talking about how the failure of people is today, I'm not going to get too much into how easily they were deceived. I mean, the Jesus movement is not the Jesus movement I saw. I mean... Everyone was anti-establishment. You would not have voted any more than you would have told someone to vote. And yet now I find more Christians telling everyone how to vote, what to vote, where to go, and how to do it. I am amazed at the carnality of people that I grew up with in the Jesus movement that were hippies. And yet now are more about America than they are about Jesus. But then when you get 
into the world and become of the world and by the world, then for the world, you're going to promote the world. And that's what I see worldly Christians doing. And so when we're talking about all this, we know and we recognize that we live in the latter. Very few people are going to accept this message. The majority are going to reject this message. Almost without a doubt, 90%, maybe less, maybe more, I don't know, I can't accurately state percentages because that's up to God, but I would say based upon humanity as such as it is in the scripture saying that many are called but few are chosen, that the majority of people are going to hear this or watch this video even after hearing and seeing it will not live it. They will not do what God has told them to do. So what I would say to you is that if we sum up what you should do on the number one cause and effect of this video series that we're starting, which is life lessons, here's your life lesson number one in introduction. And we'll be going over it, you know, in the next few series or a few sets. But it's trust. Bottom line, you can't come to God without trust. You can't come to God without faith. You can't come to God, period. I mean, God doesn't say that you, you know, have to work up some faith. God doesn't say that you have to create faith. God doesn't say that you have to go find faith. God says, I gave you faith. Yeah. He gave you a measure of faith. Now, he didn't say that he was going to give you a lot. He didn't say he was going to give you a little. I don't know what your measure of faith is, but I know you got faith because you do things based on faith. A lot of things. I'm not going to use some logic trick or some cutesy writer's um, inspirational thought, you know, to make you be trapped into, oh, you're right, I do have faith. That's because of this, you know. Lie to you by making you think something you don't already know because, bluntly, you have faith. Yes, a measure of it. I didn't say you got a lot. I didn't say you got a little. I said you got faith, period. So trust is a part of something that you have to do. People say, well, you can't trust in men. I'll go, yeah, I don't trust men. People say you can't trust your feeling. I'll go, I don't trust my feeling. People say you can't trust this, that, and the other thing. I say, I don't. I mean, I'm more in agreement with a lot of people that are non-Christians than they think. But I am in contradiction with non-Christians because... I can trust in God, period. Not like some slogan they put upon America, you know, which America doesn't trust in God, never has, never will. America trusts in the force of its own might. They trusted in that their cause was right, and then they said God will rubber stamp it, and they did what they wanted to do. Now, some men prayed, but they didn't pray and do. They prayed for God to honor their desire, and they prayed that God would bless their desire. But they didn't say, God, what do you want us to do? You see, there's a difference between having God as your backup and having God as your direction. When God chooses to direct a person, it'll be obvious by who they are and what they are and how they live. Not because they'll be without sin, but that they'll know how to deal with sin. They'll know how to deal with people. They'll deal with the reality of a sinful nature. And so... Trust has to be pointed or directed, and it has to go somewhere, because otherwise you're trusting in yourself, bottom line. You put faith in yourself. And most of what is manifested today in the religious world is faith in itself. People had an expression a while back that they said, well, we don't believe in religion. I said, I do. Every time they posted, I said, I do. I believe in religion leading me to a relationship. And I believe a relationship leads me to a religion. Exactly. Because God does create religion. He, but, you know, every time people say man made religion and God made relationship, I keep saying, what do you call Deuteronomy? He created a religion for the Jews, period. A lifestyle of religion. And that is what we're talking about. You could have called this religious lessons. It would apply. But we're calling it life lessons because that's what religion is or religious life is or even life is. Because it is in relationship to God, of course, but it's also about the practicalities of living your life every day in a real world way. So when we say trust, 
I'm going to say something, you know, very practical. I do every day, you know, if I wake up and God says go, I go. If God says stay, I stay. If I don't get told to go or stay, I don't go or stay. To put it bluntly, I ask. So trust mandates that I have to do something. It isn't something that I can just be. You know, I, you can't. One of the things that people like to say is that they're a Christian so that it's because of what they are rather than what they do. And then they say, well, you know, walk the walk or walk the talk. Well, it's not even walk the walk anymore. It's not even walk the talk. It's a life of living that we're doing. And it's not Christian. Christ-like, because I can't live like Jesus. You know, I'd like to, you know. I could, you know, do like some of the early Christians did in my Jesus movement days, and go and, you know, sell everything we have, which I did, you know, and go live in a commune, which I didn't live in a commune, but I followed Jesus. But, you know, live in a commune and do your thing, you know, and there were a lot of communes that were around at the time, and they succeeded up to a point. You know, one of the famous Jesus People USA is still in Chicago, but the point being is that there's been changes, there's been developments, there's been rearrangements. And that's where we want to get back to this series and what we're doing. We're going to say things that haven't changed for 2,000 years. And I don't care if society has. The statement hasn't. If Jesus says, go and sell all you have, he's not kidding. And I lived it. So don't tell me it can't be done. You can sell all you have to follow Jesus. You really can. Some of you need to. Some of you have no idea what it's like to trust. When you do, you'll be a follower of Jesus. When you don't, you'll be like those that follow Jesus for a season, for a while, for a time. But here's where it's interesting, the problem that I'm having after 40 years of being doing and living a life of following Jesus. Have you changed it? In other words, where did the gospel change from deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus to suddenly um, ask Jesus into your life to forgive you your sins, confess your sins, do this by doing it in front of people and by accepting all of this, you know, then you'll become a Christian and God will lead you to a church and get involved in a church and then as you grow, you'll know that you're a Christian because after all, you've been following it. Really? I'd be baptized. Really? I asked, got, and went and did. That's it. That's all. I mean, as soon as I got saved, I was out witnessing. It was like just automatic. You know, just normal act, outward response of an inward change that happened automatically. And so I'm not quite sure how we've gotten to this. And it's not even cheap grace. It's not prevenient grace. It's not any of the other biblical, theological terminologies that we try to, you know, instill upon, or the four spiritual laws. But those are observations of a lifestyle choice that people make determining for themselves how they want to approach God. And, you know, if you want to approach God through a Greg Laurie, you know, rally for the entire nation, or you want to go to a Billy Graham nation or state by state prayer meeting, you know, for the nation or for the politics of the nation, Go ahead. It's not quite what Billy did. It's not quite the way that Billy Graham was. And I, I can look at all of his crusades and say, pretty obvious, heaven, hell, and you're going there, one or the other. But what changed? Why did it change? Why are you listening to anything that has changed? So we've got to examine what we trust in order to know who we trust. Because if you trust in names, Billy Graham Association, Billy Graham Crusades with Franklin Graham, or Greg Laurie Harvest Crusades. Now, I don't have any problem with Greg Laurie having a personal relationship with God. I'm sure he does. I have a problem with Harvest Crusades with, you know, the biggest rock concerts in the world, you know, that you can go get free concerts series, you know, and a lot of people do. Christians go to go have a good old time. And some people get saved, maybe. Maybe they don't, maybe they do. I don't know. Maybe that is the way that some people do get saved. But when I hear someone tell me about Jesus, I listen carefully. Because 
I've heard Mormons tell me about Jesus, and it doesn't sound the same Jesus I know. I've heard non-Christians tell me about Jesus, and it's not the Jesus I know. I've heard some people tell me about a Jesus that it sounds like someone I know. But you see, when you know someone, you know them. And if you don't know them, then you're never going to accept what he has to say because you're going to think you know rather than know. I mean, one of the funniest things I've ever heard is like, don't judge me, man, because, you know, God said, do not judge. Well, it's true. God said, do not judge. But then he said, if you do, then you're measured by that judgment. So he says, don't do it. But because you will do it, here's what's going to happen if you do it. So both apply. God covered both bases, knowing humanity. But beyond that, he also said that a tree is, is known, not judged, by its fruit. So in some respects, those people that want to argue that argumentation fail because they don't go to the third step, which is ask God, or the fourth step, ask God. But really, what does God say? He says, well, if you're an orange tree, you're an orange. If you're a lemon tree, you're a lemon. If you're not bearing fruit, you're a fruitless tree. It seems to me that God speaks plainly. It seems to me that God speaks obviously. It seems to me that God is very clear about what he's saying. So how did Christianity get so involved in the world that it's no longer clear about what the gospel is or the great news or the good news? I had to go out and change my website to change it from the gospel because I have no clue what the gospel is today. I don't. I, I've listened to people say it and I go, no, not me. You know, that's not my gospel. That's not the gospel I heard. But the great news is that God so loved the world. The great news is that there is born unto you in the city of David a Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall save, shall save his people from their sins, who shall be for the entire world, glad tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people, a savior. And I'm thinking, I like that. That sounds like great news. That sounds like what I thought the gospel was, but they never say that. They always say, well, it's, you know, God died for your sins, and he's the atonement of propitiation, you know, and a substitution, you know, and, you know, all the other argumentations that they're making for the permutation of man choosing his own destiny and going the way he wants to go. Because reality is that I've seen more people take the gospel and run away from it, then deal with it every day. I personally think I need to be saved every day for myself, for my sins, from all that's going on. And God is at work both to do and to will of his good pleasure in me every day, as it is called today, because I live in a time-based environment. So in this study, we have to examine whether or not we're in the faith, of the faith, and by the faith, because anything that was from the beginning is still true today and will be true tomorrow. Jesus said very clearly, hey, look, I'm not coming to destroy anything. I'm not coming to replace anything. You've heard it said this, I'm making it worse. Because when you saw an eye for an eye, I'm saying, look, don't even get there. An eye for an eye was after the fact. That was after you'd already gone down the road pretty far. Before you even get to an eye for an eye, don't get there. Let them take your eye and give them your other eye too. Well, that's a pretty weird way of looking at it. Oh, it fits. You can sit down and examine it and know that it's true. That's what Jesus said and did. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves about trust and about life. Has your life become so self-managed that you don't trust in God? Are you in reality living what Jesus said or living what you have said? Can you live your faith? Can you live what you have said when it comes to standing before Jesus? Because that's going to happen. All the angels are watching, and if you've changed over the years, then you've left your first love. One of the things that I wanted to do in this first tape was to go to the book of Revelation and to say, look what return to your first love means. You've done works, you've done good things, you've done bad things, you've done everything, and you've done all these marvelous temples and religions and all this wonderful junk, you know, in your trunk. And you've got it, and, you know, it's wonderful. Uh, you know, I'm amazed, I'm impressed. But you left something out along the way. And that's what I have to ask about you today. If you've been a Christian a long time, did you leave something out along the way? 
am I suddenly the only one saying you can hear his voice and you forgot that you can? Have you forgotten that you can talk to God every day and that God is talking to you every day? Have you forgotten that you're supposed to ask him what to do, where to go, and what to say every day? That it's not a question of figuring it out, but asking about what God wants you to do. Not, oh, well, God told me to, you know, in 1969, God told me to go out and do this, you know, and you've been doing that ever since. And you never asked him for, you know, instructions since then. It's not about becoming self-sufficient, self-regulated, self-motivated, and self-determinant Christian. It's not. It's about total incomprehensible dependency upon every whim and will of the Word of God as the Spirit of God blows like the wind says to go and you decide to get up and go because you're not bound by anything of traditions or possessions or relationships and that if God said go, you could get up and go today like you should have been able to do when you got saved. Can you? Are you? Do you? My wife knows this very clearly. You know, I've told her and we've moved on it. You know, I was like, honey, God said go. It's time to go. And she's like, and you know, when we got there, it was all covered. Blew her mind. She's, <laughs> if I told her to go now, she'd probably say no, but you know, because I'd still go. I have no problem. I've been doing this all my life. But, you know, she likes being around her family and her kids. So, you know, God brought her here for a specific purpose and reason. I do believe that God's keeping her here. You know, God will keep her here. You know, I don't think she'll be buried here because I don't think she's going to die. But, you know, it's like, well, you know, at some point in time, some people are rooted in the place where they're at. Other people are told to get up and go because they became rooted. But that's not for pulling something out of the Bible and saying, ah, you know, this makes it clear, I'm supposed to do this. No, it's about what the Spirit of God with the will of the Son of God by the choice of the Father who is God telling us directly through that medium of Father, Son, and Spirit to do, to be, to live, and to go and to exist in the way He wants us to. Now, I, that leaves a wide open room, but see, trust is the problem. If you don't trust in God, then you think it's going to be all in my to Africa or you know, Timbuktu or wherever. And he might, but he might not. He might tell you to suck it up, suck it in, and go love on your neighbor or your friend or your spouse or your ex or whatever it is he wants to, at that moment, make you aware of and deal with and live with because it's not something you do once it's something that's an ongoing thing for eternity that's why I wanted to use living in eternity so much so because everything that you learn in the Christian walk if you're not extending it to every day and you're not realizing that all you're learning is for every day of your life as though it were brand new you didn't learn it you haven't applied all that it means. It's not something that's a infestation, as it were, of the Spirit of God arranging and rearranging your mind so that you might know what is the perfect and acceptable will of God in Christ Jesus. Because we're told to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is messed up. I mean, I've seen more bad discipleship than I've seen good. Because... Discipleship keeps making people into cookie-cutter Christians. I mean, they say, as I was raised up, don't become a cookie-cutter Christian, and then they turn around and make cookie-cutters. Well, and I ask them, well, um, can I ask you a question? Why are you making, and this is about, you know, Calvary Chapels and Jesus Movement, and I mean, everybody I know, I mean, especially the Jesus Movement and Calvary Chapels. Let me ask you this, you know, old Bible schools. And believe me, there's a lot of Calvary Chapel Bible schools that are off the wall. I have met some people that have said some most off-the-wall statements coming from Bible school teachers. And God bless them. They're trying, but better be careful. Better be very, very careful who you're following and who you trust in. But I've wondered, okay, look, 
didn't they do this before? Yeah, they, you know, we, we said there were no cookie cutters, but now we're, you know, masters at cookie cutting. Really? Isn't that what the Jews did? Isn't that what the Christians did? Isn't that what the German Jews did? Isn't that what the German Christians did? Isn't that what every Christian center in the world at the time before it was completely off the wall did? Started making cookie cutters? And then developing cookie cut Christians? I mean, God knows, I see, even Donald Trump claims to be a born again Christian. Although I don't think he used the word born again, I think he said Christian. And if that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. No offense. Sorry. His statements have never exemplified what Jesus said. You know, I, I think he said Jesus was a good man once, but I'm not sure. I'm not even sure of that. You know, and as a used car salesman or a used property salesman, of course he would say that. But put on the spot, I don't think he can come up with a teaching or a testimony of his faith. He can say things, and it'll sound good, but there's only one good, and that's God. No man is good, nor is any maiden. So, I'm not getting back to the basics. I'm telling you how to live your life today. And it is with God, not with me, and it's not to please me, and it's not to please man. Because, frankly, if you're walking with God, you are going to take a lot of junk from the world bunk from the system of the world and a lot of flack from your fellow Christians. But who are you trying to please? Who do you trust in? Do you trust in your counselors? Do you trust in your coaches? Do you trust in your religion? Do you trust in your church? Do you trust in your pastor? Do you trust in your preacher? Do you trust in me? I'll be the first one to say, don't trust me, man. <laughs> uh-uh. You study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. And I don't mean by going to a Bible school to do it. I mean by sitting down and having a long talk with God. God didn't go out and start a Bible school. God didn't come and send his son so that we could start a new religion or to start an old religion and renew it. God didn't say, hey, I'm going to do something, you know, that uh, has never been done before and I'm never going to ever do it again. Read that context over again, please, if you're quoting that one. Jeez. Everyone that has ever come to me with questions has always had the answer within the context of whatever they were questioning. I mean, I always looked at the question and thought, have you thought this through? Have you, I mean, I'm not a genius. I mean, maybe my IQ is a little high, I'll admit. Um, but I'm not a genius, you know, and I'm not, you know, like Mr. Know-it-all, but I'm embarrassed by my own embarrassment, so I don't want to be embarrassed because it just tends to embarrass me. So I kind of think about what I'm saying or what I'm doing and where I'm contradicting myself by my own actions or statements or words. And yet, most of humanity is a contradiction in terms. Seriously. What they say is not what they do, and what they do is not what they say, and what they say they're doing is not even accurate to what they're doing or saying. And they can contradict themselves within the same context. And that's scary to me, because that means we can be deceived. We can have delusions. We can fail of the reality of knowing God and Jesus in a personal and intimate way. Because if we're not talking to him today, how do you know what he had to say? If we're not listening to him, how do you know what God had to say? What if God was saying, tomorrow you die? And he did in a parable. Now that doesn't mean that parable didn't happen. I know people keep telling me, well, those parables are just stories. What if they're not, folks? <laughs> Jesus has a pretty good handle on all of humanity since he's been with the Creator, as the Creator, and in the Creator since the beginning of the world. I think the parables are real. And that, you know, it's a story that has real life application, not because it's a story that's about fiction, but a story that's about real people. But, stating that, coming to the conclusion that, as he said, in manner of demonstration to us, are we not in fact responsible if we are demonstrating to angels, the world, Jesus, our faith? What do you trust in? 
How do you trust? Are you trusting? Can you trust? You know, there's a another way to use the word trust. And it's like a trust fund. You know, there's been a certain amount of money committed to you, put into a trust fund. And you can draw upon it when you're a certain age. You can have it when you reach a certain criteria. That trust is something that you get to a certain amount of stipend or a certain amount of life provisions have been given you. And dare I say that this is what you are as a Christian. A trust fund, a trust has been put in your name. You can draw upon it. You can live by it. You can exist because of it, because of that trust that God has put you included into, which is that down payment, that earnest of the Spirit, that monetary, you know, down payment or that depositing of some type of marking or nature that is within you, changing you like a cancer, so to speak, from the world, which you're a cancer to the world, because it's got to kill you or you will kill the world. But because you are that, where or what is your trust? I mean, don't get me wrong, there are people that have a trust in the world. That's by their bank account, by their, they draw upon it, their job, they draw upon that, their wife, they draw upon that. What are you drawing upon? What is your bank account? What is your pulling your life essence from? Do you get your meaning for living from, you know, the X Games, you know, a thrill seeker? Do you get it from drugs? Do you just, you know, co-opt your faith and trust into something of just existing, you know? Do you lie to yourself? Do you belie yourself by saying that you're looking, though you've already found? By saying you don't know when you already know? By denying the fact that God exists when you already know He does? Trust. Sober-minded, we're told to be in these latter days. Serious-minded. America has come to those times, not because America is less Christian. It's the same kind of Christian it was 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago. Nothing's changed. It's just more obvious. It's come out of the woodwork. It's behind closed doors is now be obvious because no longer is he that which restrains holding it back, but it's coming to the forefront. He which hindereth no longer hinders. So, sobriety teaches me that I need to look at things with a clear mind, an honest conscience, a awareness that something is occurring and that I need to know and to understand it, to be aware that it's going to affect me. As such, we have dedicated this to the Spirit of God to lead us what little time he's going to still influence us by sharing the truth, which is the Word of God. It's not my doctrine or my belief or my religion or my faith or my relationship with Jesus, but the truth is Jesus. What he says goes, and what he, where he goes is what is said, and he has done that and lived that. So. Trust is a matter of lifestyle choice, but what you put your trust in is going to determine whether you're going to heaven or whether you're going to hell.